Okay, I'm going to give you a few updates about what's going on with Islandora and uh, with our Islandora community. So our team here at the Islandora Foundation, we're pretty small. It's just uh, me. I'm the project community manager and my colleague, Danny Lamb, who's our technical lead. Uh, he is unfortunately uh, ushering children to school this morning, so he's not able to join me, but I'm going to put on my tech lead hat and hopefully, I, I've seen him give this session enough that hopefully I can cover his slides uh, reasonably well. Uh, so we'll start with the very basics. What is Islandora? Um, for those of you who are not familiar, who've not worked with it, or who have only heard the name in passing. Um, the easiest way to describe Islandora is it's Drupal paired with Fedora. Uh, we use a Drupal front end over a Fedora storage layer. Um, so this is a pretty simple visual metaphor, but in the Islandora community, we really like to use uh, food to explain things. So we actually have these two nice cartoony food metaphors that we like to use to explain the two different primary versions of Islandora. Uh, so Islandora 7, the previous version, which worked with Fedora 3 and Drupal 7, was a cheeseburger. Uh, Fedora was our bottom bun. That's our storage layer. We're actually keeping your digital assets. Drupal is the presentation layer. That's the top bun where you actually are managing them in your website layer. Uh, Islandora is that patty in the middle that lets those two things talk to each other. And then all of the different toppings and sauces and vegetables that you might want to put on your cheeseburger. These were different utility modules, uh, viewers, different derivative creation tools, basically ways to customize your Islandora to exactly what your institution needed. Uh, so this is a nice memorable metaphor. It's also uh, a pretty good illustration of one of the challenges of working with Islandora 7 in that it's a, it's a vertical stack. It's really designed to work on a single server. And if you want to spread out those processes and have some of your toppings running somewhere else, it took a little bit of extra effort to get that working. It wasn't really designed so that you could spread it across multiple servers. Um, so a few years back when Fedora 3 moved to Fedora 4, uh, coincidentally Drupal uh, also moved from 7 to 8. And it was a similar big backwards breaking change where they changed some very fundamental things about Drupal. So we took the opportunity since our bottom layer and our top layer were both having these big fundamental breaking changes. We decided to re-architect Islandora as well to take better advantage of the things that both Drupal and Fedora do really well and to learn from our experiences working with Islandora five and six and seven over the years and start over a little bit. Uh, so now our visual metaphor for um, eating Islandora is a bento box. So we built it with horizontal, horizontal scaling in mind. So it's this much more modular approach where if you want to take your sushi and run it on a different server, it's very easy to do that. It expects you to be able to do that. Um, it's also much easier to replace a particular component. So if you want to use Elasticsearch instead of Solar, for instance, you can pick out Solar, put Elasticsearch in, and because it's much more modular, you don't really have to change anything else about the software. It's agnostic about all of the different pieces. They work together much more cleanly. Um, this was also an opportunity for us to allow the components to do their jobs better. So we're using Fedora not as a database anymore. We're using it as smart storage. It's a preservation layer. We're not asking it to do things that it wasn't really meant to do. We're also using Drupal as much more of a Drupal tool. Uh, Islandora content in Islandora 7 was in its own little silo that Drupal could present but couldn't really read. And now in Islandora 8, your content is first-class Drupal content, which means you can use the dozens and hundreds of modules that are created by the Drupal community to expand your Islandora site, which really opens up just a whole world of options. <clears throat> so this is a quick list of what Islandora 8 does right now. I'm not going to go read through all of this, but you can see we we're hitting a lot of the big notes. And a lot of this comes Again, just from being able to use Drupal tools off the shelf and have them work on your Islandora content. And some of this comes off the shelf from Fedora um, <clears throat> and letting Fedora do the things that Fedora is really meant to do and not trying to cram it into a box it's not supposed to fit into. I think it's, uh, some of the highlights, uh, we have IIIF support. Um, we work now with OpenSeaDragon and as of last week, uh, the Mirador viewer is enabled in Islandora as well. Um, Multilingual content and interface. This is a big one in, in some of our pilot sites. They're able to present both the content, but then the entire interface, the navigation, everything can be presented in multiple languages to end users. And that's a big feature of Drupal. Uh, and Docker deployment. This is also fairly new. We have uh, an Ansible build that you can use to spin up Islandora pretty quickly, but we've also 
uh, now just completed work on a Docker deployment as well, which really works well with that scalable bento box aspect of things where you can take different pieces and spin them up on different servers as needed. Uh, this is Danny's really complex technical diagram of the stack, uh, and I'm grateful that it, it's kind of done this way because I think this means I can translate it for you. Um, so this is obviously oversimplified, but the point is that Drupal is now at the center of the architectural stack. So everything you do in Island Or, you're interacting with things through Drupal. Uh, and that uh, asynchronously speaks out to all these different tools using image magic to process your images, uh, Candle Open your Drupal IF. I think this is FFmpeg for processing videos and audio files, solar search. And we are talking to Fedora via a tool called Fly System, which I'll talk to, I'll talk about a little bit more in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, this is the much more complex uh, architectural stack. I'm not going to walk you through this, but I threw it in here. So if you want to follow that link to the slides, you can have a look at this. And uh, full credit to Gavin Morris at Born Digital and Bethany Seeger at Johns Hopkins University for putting together what I think is probably one of the best architectural diagrams we've ever had of Islandora. Um, but it doesn't have any pictures of wizards or fruit on it, so I'm going to move past it. So what we're using Fedora for now in the new bento box stack um, are the things that Fedora is really good at doing. So it's smart storage now. In Islandora 8, we were using Fedora as the database layer, which meant we were storing things in Fedora that really didn't need to be there, things that you don't really need to preserve. Like we had our preservation files in there. We had your metadata files in there. That's great. But we also had your thumbnails in Fedora and we're using Fedora to serve them up whenever you needed to see a thumbnail, which is not really something Fedora was meant to be used for. Uh, so now we are just using Fedora as that preservation layer. We're only putting things in Fedora that you actually want to preserve. And those more transient files that don't need to be preserved long term, we're just keeping those at the Drupal layer so they can be served up a little bit faster and it's a little less resource intensive. Uh, Fedora is also the source for fixity checking in Islandora. Uh, Memento versioning, that lovely Wayback Machine compatible Memento that you can keep as your, your, your objects. And we're really excited about OCFL and uh, making sure that Islandora is going to be compatible with Fedora 6 as soon as possible because our community is looking forward to being able to work with OCFL. And this is that uh, fly system tool that was in the cartoon diagram. Uh, so this is a PHP abstraction layer that lets you, uh, in our case, point Drupal at any kind of different file system. So it comes with adapters for things like uh, Amazon S3 or Microsoft Azure, or you can even point it at a hard drive that's sitting on your desk. Um, and we built a special adapter then to talk to Fedora. And this lets you treat Fedora as your file storage in Drupal. So when you're working with Islandora, you're just loading things into Drupal. And as far as Drupal's concerned, everything is just Drupal content you're putting into a file system. Fly system then in the back end is actually taking those things and putting them into Fedora, but that's all invisible to the end user. So you still get that graphical user interface and everything is just kind of passed through in the back end and handled for you to go into your smart storage layer. So that was the bird's eye view of the technical side of things, which is really not my area. Now I'm going to talk to you a bit about the Islandora community that's actually building and supporting this tool. And this is, a, I know a little bit more about this part. Um, so this is our community by the numbers. Um, some statistics kind of around our community. We're not huge, um, but we are a decent sized uh, group supporting a project like this. And we have a very active culture of peer support, which is really important for the sustainability of Islandora. Uh, there are only the two employees at the Islandora Foundation. So a tremendous amount of the work is done by volunteers, is done by the institutions and the users that are actually working with Islandora. So it's, it's very much like Fedora in that way. We thrive on the contributions of the people that are actually using the software. Uh, you can also look at the Islandora community as being just all of those places that are using Islandora. So we know about at least 320 of them out there, uh, but Islandora doesn't have a license or you don't have to pay, there's no paid licensing with it. And it doesn't have any sort of like phone home um, component to it that lets us know when people are using it. So we assume there are probably quite a few more of them out there that have just downloaded it and are running it quietly and we haven't stumbled across them in the wild. Uh, but as far as known sites go, we're on every continent except Antarctica at this point. 
this is another look at our community. This is our, our diagram of all the different ways that our community interacts to support the software. And I think this one is particularly important because it highlights the fact that we don't just need the contribu contributions from volunteer developers. Island Ore is really sustained by a wide variety of skills and contributions, and that's reflected here. We've got volunteers who are part of our project governance. Uh, we've got volunteers who work together in interest groups, sharing their knowledge and sharing the work around particular topics like institutional repositories or metadata. Uh, we, volunteers do a lot of the testing. They write the documentation for our releases. Uh, even when people come together at our Island or our camps or our conferences and share their work and experience, that's all part of the sustainability of an open source project like this. But standing behind that community, there is uh, an organization, the Island Aura Foundation. We're a soliciting nonprofit incorporated in Canada. And just like Fedora, we are member supported. So I have a slide thanking those members. Uh, these are the folks that are actually providing financial contributions to the project, uh, in addition, usually to a lot of volunteer contributions as well. These are very engaged community members. Uh, but this funding is what allows us to have staff, lets us put on events, uh, lets us get, do work on special projects, and really this is what keeps the light on at the lights on at the Island Aura Foundation. Uh, I have a very slick, nicely produced org chart here that someone made for us, which is really nice and it's on our website. Um, I prefer to do it with cartoon lobsters to make it stick a little bit better, so this is a look at how our organization comes together. Uh, we have a board of directors that handle our legal and financial and overall strategic decisions. We've got a coordinating committee uh, that handles more of our operational and our policy things like roadmaps. This is kind of like Fedora steering and Fedora leadership. Uh, we have a technical advisory group. These are more technical members of our community. They work more closely with Danny. And that's a, a place to discuss more sticky questions about the technical roadmap. This group is good for determining when do we stop supporting an old version of PHP? When do we need to upgrade to the latest version of Drupal? Uh, we have committers. These are community members who've made really significant and sustained contributions to Islandora. So we've given them additional authority over the code. These are the folks that uh, they review and approve any changes that are suggested to the Islandora code base. And finally, there's, there's me and Danny uh, toiling away, really liaising with and trying to support all of these other groups and all these other volunteers that are getting the actual work done. I'm going to round out here by showing you a few examples of Island Aura 8 uh, in production. Most of those 320 sites uh, out there on the map were, are still using Island Aura 7 and therefore they're using Fedora 3. Uh, but we did release Island Aura 8 last year. So there are uh, quite a number of them that have, quite a number of sites that have moved over now and are using um, Island Aura 8 and Fedora 5 is, is the most common backend for Island Aura 8 right now. So we will start with um, Open Access Kent State, OAKS. This one is the very first institutional repository uh, that went into production using Islandora 8. There's a lot of them in Islandora 7, but this is the first one in 8. Um, and as a result of the work they did to build this, being kind of on the bleeding edge of institutional repositories in 8, uh, they built a tool to uh, support OAI PMH harvesting, and that's been rolled right back into core Islandora. Another really interesting thing they're doing with their Islandora is integrating it directly with open journal systems. So that's the, the most popular journal, open source journal publishing tool in the world. And they're using open journal systems to do the editorial workflow, all of the peer review, all of the editing happens in OJS. And then Islandora is the endpoint to actually publish the results when they're all finished. Uh, Canterbury Stories here, I think is actually the first Islandora 8 site that went live on the internet. Um, and this was kind of born out of a, a fairly tragic situation where there were some devastating earthquakes in Christchurch, New Zealand. And one of the outcomes from those earthquakes was um, to highlight the vulnerability of the city libraries and the physical collections that they were storing in those libraries. So this prompted a big move to digitize a lot of these vulnerable collections and they chose Islandora 8 as the platform for storing the results. Uh, so there's a lot of, of, a lot of photographs, a lot of visual content in here. It's a very pretty site. Um, they are also adhering to accessibility, New Zealand's accessibility standards, uh, which Drupal uh, has fairly good access, accessibility tools. That's where a lot of that's coming in. Um, but one of the features of New Zealand's accessibility standards is that you have to be able to access the site in both English and Maori. So this site is fully translatable. All the interface, all the navigation, everything in there can be done in, both, in two languages. Next up is the Latin American Digital Initiatives Project, or LADI. Uh, this was done out of the University of Texas at Austin in collaboration with several Latin American libraries. 
Uh, this is another multi-language site. It's uh, Portuguese, Spanish, and English, not just content, but again, the entire interface is available in all three languages. And um, they're following a principle of post-custodialism, where instead of taking the content from those libraries and storing it at the University of Texas, they're taking digital versions of the content and they're going to steward and preserve those digital copies while leaving the original contents with the creators. Uh, so it was very important that this be a multi-language site, this be accessible in those three languages, so that the communities who actually created the content are going to be able to access it in their own language. Uh, and this is also one of the first examples of paged content done in Islandora very early on. So that's you know, books, newspapers, that complex sequential content where an object is not just one digital thing, it's a bunch of digital things strung together in a particular way. Archives Central here, I think this is the most recent launch of an Islandora site. Uh, this is also out of New Zealand. And uh, it's kind of a, a multi-site in that they are uh, serving multiple New Zealand councils in a single site and then differentiating them with, with branding and theming on, those, on the individual uh, council pages. So they've migrated over 200,000 records out of a legacy system called Kete. And they've modeled everything in the records and context data model. So this is not just um, an early Island Aura 8. This is also, uh, according to the developers, it's one of the first implementations of the records in context data model uh, live in production because it's in development for quite a while. But this is a fully functional records in context uh, implementation in production. And finally, uh, research data management at the University of Prince Edward Island. Uh, UPEI is where Island Aura was born uh, back in 2006, and they've kind of stayed on the cutting edge, the bleeding edge of development ever since. And it's, it's hard to summarize all of the different tools they built for this, because what they had is a grant funded project that wrapped up this year to build a fully functional, full life cycle, re full life cycle research data management tool in Island Aura 8. Um, so this lets you create persistent IDs, there's uh, data management planning tools for the whole start of the process. Uh, it integrates with ORCID, with data site. Uh, there's virus scanning when you're uploading your new files. There's uh, very complex editorial workflows supported under the box. Um, it has a uh, bag it service for handling bags of files, uh, event logging, versioning for everything from, da from your data sets and media. Uh, and it's a really robust, very complete research data management tool. And a lot of what they've built has rolled back into the core of Islandora, and more pieces are in the process of rolling back into the core of Islandora. Uh, but if research data management is of interest, this is a fully supported suite with really excellent documentation that does it all in the one spot. And I think I've left a couple of minutes for questions. Um, Hopefully I'm able to answer them. If not, I will, I will pass them on to, uh, to our tech lead and get back to you with an answer if it's too technical, but do my best. Okay, thank you very much, Melissa. Does anyone have any questions? Again, uh, either unmute yourself and ask directly or stick it in the chat window and we'll deal with it that way. Oh, raise that. Robert. Melissa. <laughs> Uh, you can certainly refer me to someone else if this is better handled out of band, but I'm wondering about that uh, UPI research data management platform. Mm -hmm. Do they also have the workflow like for the collaborative end? Like when, you know, they're planning for their grant, they put that information in, but then while they're collaborating and all the different roles through curation, do they have that kind of workflow and ontologies for the different disciplines worked in? I'm not sure about the ontology piece. I'd have to go check or, or talk with somebody at the, at the platform. They definitely have the, the collaboration workflow supported. Uh, That's interesting, thanks. Yeah. Just as a follow-up to that for myself, uh, is there a website describing the work available? There is, let me grab that link for you and I'll, I'll put that into the chat. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, last call, any further questions? Um, does, uh, does Islandora make any assumption regarding your uh, data model that you use to like describe um, your collection or your documents? Uh, it's very flexible. We don't make a lot of assumptions going in. We ship with a default form that is kind of designed to handle uh, a semblance of mods metadata because that was what was in Islandora 7 and that's really just to facilitate um, migrations from Islandora 7 into 8. 
but in terms of your data model, that's really up to you. We've tried, we've designed it to be as agnostic as possible, and all of that's just managed through Drupal forms and Drupal fields and mapping that into to RDF in Fedora.